have given them faith by not being frightened when the alphabet soup agencies come in and do the whole, you know, uh, you know, we're going to put you in a padded cell type thing. So a lot of people have the greatest admiration for what you're doing. Yeah, look, Ron, Ron uh, put that up there with uh, Gerald on the University of Eucadia site. Uh-huh. And I, I, I know that it's, it's having a rippling effect right across the board. I know in a number of places like the UK and Australia uh, and Canada, people are very keen to, to take it and modify that knowledge because it, it mirrors, as you, it's different wording, but it mirrors the same processes in these other areas as well. So it's been fantastic. Thank you. Oh, good, good. I just wanted to double check with you guys and... Um... And like I said, there's some more information that's coming our way that uh, what I want to remind people of what's powerful about it is, is use the public record. That is your your sounding board with regards to property to give notice. And if there's anything that I have found, uh, if you do these and don't put them on the public record, they just still treat you like a, a dummy. But when you use it and put it on the public record, now they're kind of going, uh oh, we have a little bit of a problem here. That's what I'm seeing. So I'm just encouraging people that that is a very important part of what I have found that they react to. Well, I, I absolutely agree with you on that. And, and again, thanks for, for raising that because it ties in nicely with part of the chat tonight about not falling into mistakes and reminding ourselves of, of, of not doing mistakes. And, and one of the mistakes we've made is is believing that the private documents that we create um, is the only source of, of uh, remedy. There is a whole raft of remedy in their system by what you've learned and what Ron is picking up and what others are picking up by applying it. And what the private side is doing is it's reinforcing. It means that we've got both a private and a public. Mm-hmm. So I think it's the balancing of the two. Don't you agree that yes. it's, it's when you can prove both on the private and on the public, which is their system, that really they have nowhere to turn? Yes? Oh, absolutely. And I have a quick story real quick. Uh, yeah. We, we, we uh, go to the uh, courthouse and we video these auctions. And oftentimes they hire some local attorney to show up and no documents and auction off the house because it's a non-judicial state here. Well, usually you come in, we bring in like four witnesses plus the homeowner and video cameras. What's interesting is you're waiting around for the auction to occur. occur. I, I just love doing this, and I'm I'm really facetious about a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of people say, Dawn, you're better than packing a pistol. Can I pull you out of my back pocket? <laughs> and I just laugh. <laughs> so any, anyway, uh, what I do, Frank, is I get into, well, gosh, they don't even understand the rights of replevin, blah, 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 blah. And I know these two attorneys are sitting there. They, at first, they treat you like idiots. You yep. know, like, well, here we are. We're going to sell a house, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, what I do is I turn my back to them, have the little group, and we kind of act like we're doing a powwow. And, of course, I have my dad there, and, and I start talking about the rights of replevin and putting this on the court public record and uh, you know I use a lot of your information I tell you what you start I have my dad you know give me clues as to their reaction all of a sudden they're sitting up in their chairs they're kind of looking at each other they're kind of going what's she talking about and of course I get my friends to go oh I guess you're absolutely right Dawn geez you know they use these attorneys and these private bar societies and they have no clue talk about the dumbest of the dumb you know you have to feel sorry for them you know they're just a tool and (laughs) I will tell you Frank it is quite interesting that by the time they get up there and they say that the auction has been canceled they're like uh, and you overhear them talking what what's she talking about? What what is this rights of Republican? What is this about deeds and trust law? You, well, you they have no I mean? idea. That's right. Yeah. You see, uh, the and 
and again, I think this is a, a, a great timing. Uh, I know that Greg, uh, and I'm hoping that Greg Pappas will will actually do a bit of a chat on this uh, in um, in the coming uh, week or so. Is the power, particularly in court, of elocution, the right of elocution, mm-hmm. is another right another right that that we've we've been remiss in not bringing forward. So the the knowledge of the bar, I don't. I truly, when I look at the the history of the bar, if people have challenged them, they've come, unfortunately, from the angle of of being completely adversarial. So the bar has dealt with them accordingly, you know, as a non-responsive witness or, uh, you know, basically fobbed off the antagonism. They've never dealt with um, even-handed, competent, honourable people really going at the heart. And so I think for years and years and years they've been reproducing people that really can can get away with not knowing a lot. So right. now they've got to basically work for their supper and, and, and uh, you're frightening the hell out of them. <laughs> oh, oh, it does. And by the time it's done, you know, they get up there and they, they say, well, this is cancelled. I have had now on four different occasions they turn around and say, uh, you know, we have no clue what you were talking about. That's very interesting, but we wish you the best of luck. Now, it starts off where they come in there with an arrogant attitude, treating you like you're some ignorant, you know, non mentis compa, you know. Wow. Yeah, non compa mentis, yeah. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wow. You just see the whole energy field change, and that's exactly how I would describe it. You've changed the energy field around you. And uh, it's it's quite interesting, but I'll tell you, it is fun. When you do know what you're doing and you're talking about, to a degree, you can have a lot of fun with this, and that's what I encourage people. You know, educate yourself. Have fun with it. Well, <laughs> yeah, I... I... I, I'm not too sure if I'd say I'm, I love your attitude. I'm not too sure I would say about the fun, but just as a as a wrap up for now. And, and again, thank you to yes. you, your husband, and to everyone that is is helping. You are a shining light. You really are. But I just as a wrap up now, um, unless you have another, if you want to add anything to this, they are reading the material. And whilst there are many, many people who are coming up with fantastic information, the one thing that is core to Eucadia is that we are building a foundation to restore the law. And so whilst you or Ron or Greg or anyone is looking at the remedies within the system and the knowledge within the system, that private underpinning, the ecclesiastical deed, the live-born record, membership of society, the canons, the law, all of that underpins what you're doing. And so when they go digging, rather than it being a group that's struck upon a little bit of information on IRS or a little bit of information, that is something that shouldn't be discounted, that you are standing on top of a mountain. You are not simply standing on air and that is a historic difference to where we've been in the past so good on you dawn thank you oh oh yes and and real quick what i meant by have fun is 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 go in there with the spirit of i'm not going to be intimidated i'm not going to be afraid this is just a non-judicial auction so why not why not go in there positively enjoy yourself bring friends along their witnesses they will add to it and and quite frankly it, it can be and then we go out and have um, a bite to eat afterwards and so that's what i'm just encouraging people that you, you don't have to do it from a negative or adversarial standpoint uh, you can come at it from a very positive angle, and it does change the energy of what happens that day. We have seen it um, now 15 different times. Amazing. Well, you are, as I say, you're a shining light, and uh, you have a, a, a very large and, and rapidly growing fan club. So thanks again. <laughs> well, thank you, Frank. You guys have a good evening. Okay. Thank you, Dawn, for mm-hmm. sharing. Thank you for everything. All right, let's go to Greg here. Greg? Uh, Greg? 
Hi, Terry. Hi, Frank. Hi. Hi, Greg. I, uh, um, this issue of the allocution, um, I would, I will do the audio with, uh, Gerald and if, if with you, possibly if you have the time, but I'll at least do it with Gerald and we'll, we'll get it up on the, on the, the university.ucadia. But my experience with, uh, allocution goes back about almost 14 years with, uh, Robert James Fox down in Texas, who I believe if Gerald hasn't forwarded it to you, I'll send you a, summation of his case that just completed over in Jacksonville, Texas. And he's uh, probably the only guy I know that's never lost a court case, <laughs> wow. ever. And um, he started teaching me elocution back, I think, in 97, and uh, or 98, but I think it was 97. And it was regarding, I, I was working with him. He's quoted in a case, famous case. It's a U.S. versus Robert James Fox, 1990 or 91. It was United States Code Annotated. And he won his case about identification in federal court in Dallas on the, at the prima facie break. Uh, he didn't even have to make a defense. He just showed the court that the prosecution hadn't proven their case, and the judge agreed and basically gave the win to Robert. And I think he was used in over 1,000 or 2,000 cases after that, and the Congress had to go back and change the laws so people couldn't create their own identification anymore. <laughs> but... <laughs> but but he, but during that process, uh, he learned about um, a, a, a last-ditch effort. It was before we even understood the concept of uh, straw men or any of those things that come out, you know, with uh, the early Elvik and, and things back in 1998, 99. And uh, anyways, Robert had uh, – so I asked him, I said, so if I fail everywhere, how can I pull the rabbit out of the hat at the very end just before they try to throw me in prison? And that's when he taught me the allocution and – um, it was used on a case with a, a, a minister down in, in California, I believe in the Central Valley, who um, had retired and opened up a, um, a, a home for runaway kids. And these kids had been abused, and they started telling him things that were going on by public officials. Anyways, long and short of it, um, the, got back to some of the public officials that he knew about what they were molesting children and, and runaways and so they prosecuted the minister and accused him of doing the very thing that they were doing. And long and short of it, based on the motions in limine, none of his evidence or affidavits of the children was allowed during his trial. So he was convicted. And, and so this man, I believe his name was Austin Miles, he, he contacted Robert Fox. And Rob, being that the guy was a minister, Robert told him he needed to do it orally and put it in writing only for himself, not to file it into the case. And long and short of it is all the evidence that was by the motions and women, he were not allowed as a defense at the trial, he introduced at his allocution. And um, I think the allocution took well over an hour, read off every affidavit, cited it, and basically named names as to who all the perpetrators on all the children were, and that the children had signed and sworn affidavits that this minister had never touched any of them inappropriately. Long and short of it, he uh, did the allocution, and the key to the allocution was that he actually completed what he was saying and stood up, packed up all his papers, turned around and walked out of the courtroom. And even though the judge was yelling at him and there were bailiffs threatening him, none of the bailiffs actually ever touched him. And he walked out of the courtroom and went home and nobody ever went after him again. And so we have anecdotal evidence. And I've spoken with Austin after this had happened, but I don't have any physical written proof, but that the sheriff had resigned from being a sheriff and the judge was off the bench within like two or three months after he had done his allocution. I have firsthand evidence of a case which I can send a, it's an anecdotal, I mean, it's actually firsthand with a buddy of mine in Bozeman, Belgrade, Montana, uh, and he had done this in 2003, and um, he had uh, basically been pulled over on a traffic issue, which obviously gives you your summary judgment cases in front of a magistrate. Now that you've yes. explained that to us, we know what was happening. Anyways, he was in front of a judge and uh, a commissioner, judge, magistrate, whatever she was. She was in her mid-40s, and she um, had a packed courtroom, and Bill was back in for a second time, had been arrested, and um, went in there on bond. Anyways, he, he couldn't prove that he had insurance that day. It had expired the day before, and he asked the judge if he, she let him know when she's going to issue sentencing, and she said, well, right now. And he says, well, I'm going to make my allocution. Caught her and about 100 people or 50 people at least in the courtroom completely off guard, and he read an allocution that he and I had worked on for about a month, and he read it, and it was really kind of a little short deal, let her know that he wasn't going to participate in the in her conviction or her sentencing, that he didn't accept it and was not contracting with her, and 
and told her that he um, wasn't going to go to jail or prison.